Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, we're going to be looking at Daniel 11, um, verse 1. And uh, there's a lot of information that we have to go through. Uh, but before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear, dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the time here this morning. We just invite your spirit to instruct us and to guide and direct these studies um, so that we can have a clear understanding of the time that we are in. Help us to see the symbols and to interpret them correctly. We pray for this movement. We pray for um, the people in Romania that I was studying with. And we pray that you can bless them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, Daniel 11, verse 1. What's the symbol there? What symbol do we have? 11, 1. We have the symbol, of course, of Darius, the Mead. Okay, well, what about 11 1 itself? True. Okay, so what is that symbol? As was asked in the chat, is that 111 weeks? Okay, so it can be 111 weeks. It can be the 777 structure. Now, that, that symbol, though, of January 11th, has shown up twice in our lives, right? So if we took it as the 11th day of the first month on our calendar, January 11th, it shows up in that structure of the Levitical chiasm being that last date, that 63 weeks before March 27th, 2021, right? 441 days, right? So that Jeff had recognized. And it was this January 11th date when Daniel Fontenot was presenting that it was impressed upon Jeff's mind that we had this understanding of Daniel chapter 11, right? So it seems appropriate that that date fits that. I don't think Jeff connected that date uh, with Daniel 11, 1, but we can see that it must. So if that's the case, if we take Daniel 11, verse 1, um, we can put this at January 11th. Now, we have the two January 11ths. We have the one in uh, 2019, or is it 2020, pardon me, the one in 2020. And then we have the one in 2023. So we have one three years later. That's going to be dealing with Collins' study, um, where if we were to t count the days, we would come to this January 11th date as the end of his structure, this prophetic mirror that he has. So if we're going to relate it to how we're trying to understand Daniel chapter 11, uh, especially this first part, how then do we relate it? What, what does this tell us? I'm running slow this morning. I'm not really understanding that question. Okay, so we have this symbol that we can tie to to Jeff's study, which is right. Levitical chiasm, and to Colin's study. So this same symbol ties to both of these. It also is connected to 111 weeks, that is 777 days, right? So, so if we have this symbol and we're looking at this now in the context of Jeff's study and in the context of Colin's study, because Colin's study is directly addressing these verses, right? Starting with Daniel 11 verse 1. So how do we then, how do, how do we take a symbol like this and, and how do we interpret? Do we just say, well, there's a symbol and it reminds us of these other things? Or can we take that symbol as some kind of anchor where we can place what we're looking at in our time? So that, 
because we have a symbol. The thing is, what do we do with that symbol? Because normally when, when we do this, when we take Darius, we place him with, this is Darius the Mede, we place him with Reagan, right? Right. Okay. So, and that's an application, right? We, we have to recognize that that's an application of these verses. That is, when we read these verses, when he's talking about the first year of Darius the Mede, that's a historical event. And, and we create a line. And when we parallel that line in, in its direct interpretation, this, this is going to be connected with the line of the three decrees, right? That is, we have these three decrees that begin the 2300 days. And then it's going to tie us to the three angels' messages that end the 2300 days. So we have these three decrees. You can't have a third without the first and the second, just as you can't have the third angel's message without the first and the second. Ellen White's clear that we need all three decrees to complete the specification of the prophecy that, that is of Daniel chapter 9, the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. You can't just jump to Artaxerxes' decree and say, well, that's just the decree I'm going to pick. You need to recognize that, that this is a progressive event. And what we have done in this movement is we've seen first that the captivity is the result of Leviticus 26, these four seven times, and that these three decrees are involved in ending those periods of time of 70 years, 140 years, and 220 years that are created by the literal application of Leviticus 26 to literal Israel. That is, you're going to take those seven times as being uh, symbols of seven years, and it's going to be applied in, there's 490 years that they don't keep the sabbatical rest of the land, so there's 70 years captivity. The temple stands for 420 years, and then it rests for 70 years before it's dedicated again, the second temple. Right. So all of these, these symbols um, that we have then are applying, so we're taking... Leviticus 26, we're applying it to those periods of time. They become symbols. 70 becomes a symbol of probation. Daniel has this vision of the 70 weeks, which is based on those 490-year periods. And now we're at the end of the captivity, because that's where Daniel had been concerned, all through Daniel chapter 9 and 10. Uh, in chapter 9, remember, he's going to uh, have this uh, statement made by the angel Gabriel saying, um, at the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I'm come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved, therefore understand the matter and consider the vision. And we know the matter is the 70 weeks, and the vision is the 2300 days. So he's going to consider that. So the 70 weeks is going to be presented to him. That's the matter, or the word, or the debar. And then He's going to look at that in connection with the 2300 days, right? So then in chapter 10, verse 1, when it says um, he understood the thing and an understanding of the vision, we, we again say that this is now he understood the 70 weeks and now he fully understands the 2300 days, right? So that's, that's what we see in chapter 10. So... So he has that understanding. So now he's praying and fasting uh, for 21 days. No, well, it's not a complete fast, I don't think. No pleasant bread, neither flint came flesh nor wine. So it could be that he's not eating at all. Um, so he's fasting for this 21 days. And then he has this vision of Christ. And he's going to be given a view of history. And that view of history, we would say it, this is the most literal of Daniel's prophecies in that there's still symbols involved, but it's going to go through the history of Medo-Persia and its transition to Greece and ultimately to Rome and then to our time, right? So it's going to bring us through all of this history. So if we're going to Dan Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, and we're seeing this symbol that's from our time, 
That means we're making an application of this history to our time. That is, we believe that there's a repeat of history, that the events of the past, which are fulfillments of prophecy, are types of the end of the world. So we can take this history of Darius and these Persian kings, and we can look at the symbols that are here, and we say we can say we can apply this to 1989. Right? We can apply it to Daniel 11, verse 40b, and the history that follows up to verse 45. Right? So, so we can do that. That's what this movement has done. But we have this symbol of January 11th. And so then we say, is there an application where we can take this history and even zoom in more and understand what was happening in our time? Is there some way in which we understand that? Or do we just simply take these symbols, January 11th, as relating to what Jeff was teaching with the January 11th date and what Colin was teaching with the January 11th date and somehow see that this gives us, gives, us, gives us information to help us interpret this correctly. It is, we're going to make an application to our time. And Jeff has done that and Colin has done that. And, and we need to know how we're making that application, how we can do this. So that's what I get from Daniel 11, verse 1, is that it, it, it's giving us this information. We have to decide how we're going to use it. Does that help a little bit? It does. Okay. So... So this is uh, Gabriel speaking to Daniel. He says, I also, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I even stern, stood to confirm and strengthen him. At least that's who I believe that is talking, is, is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. <clears throat> and he's talking about what had happened when Babylon fell. So it's going to bring us back to the fall of Babylon. Now, that's going to be October 13th, 539 B.C. So remember, October 13th is also a date that's in the line of the Levitical chiasm, right? We're going to have June 9th, August 11th, 63 days later, and then um, we're going to have uh, October 13th. And then we're going to have 329 days. It's going to bring us to September 7th, uh, November 9th, and then... January 11th, 2020. So that's the chiastic structure. And that chiasm, the first part of it, relates directly to Millerite history. Right? It's going to be basically the pattern of Samuel Snow's letters in that history in 2018 where the movement goes through that uh, time-setting period. Right? So we're going to be setting these dates. So October 13th is one of those dates, as is January 11th. So, so is it significant that we're tying the date that marks the end of the first 126 days with this symbol that ends the second period of 126 days? Is everybody clear what I'm talking about? We can bring up the diagram. Bring up the diagram. Okay. <clears throat> so just take a second here. Now, as as a point, did yeah. I under, did I understand you correctly to state that you believe that the angel that was appearing to Daniel at that point was Gabriel? The angel that's talking right here is Gabriel. That's what I, I I've tried to figure this out in the past because, um, you know, because you have Christ and Gabriel here, right? Correct. Okay. 
And but, in verse 21, it says, but I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth, that there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So my view then is that the one that is speaking then in the next verse is, is still Gabriel. But it could be, he's saying, I, also I, in the first year of Darius the Mede, even I stood to confirm and strengthen him. It could be changing to Christ here. Well, okay. I, I, I would take the Hebrew that where he, he emphasizes the I, even I, that he's just saying, this is Gabriel still speaking. But do you have any thoughts on this? Well, yeah, I do. Now, one of the things that all of us are, are quite aware of is there was one book that was published after the death of Mrs. White that was primarily written by her, as far as we know, and that's Prophets and Kings. Yeah, it was all written by her. You can't say no. primarily. It was no. written by her because i've i've looked into it in a lot of detail and there's there's no words that are not hers these were taken from review and herald articles that were were put together but there is not uh, additions by man filling in ellen white's words there's editing where you know you're going to take uh, uh different different sections that she's written and rearrange them but it is written by Ellen White. It's not primarily written by Ellen White. It's not well, written by any man. No man added words to it. Okay. When when I was doing a search, yeah. and I'm, I am not in any way trying to cause any doubt. I'm just making a notation here. Yeah. When, when we look using prophets and kings, Mm-hmm. From Prophets and Kings, page 556.3 mm -hmm. to 557.1, we have three paragraphs that are covering Daniel 11.1. One. Okay. But what I found most interesting is the key phrase, <clears throat> the mighty Gabriel. Okay. Occurs only in prophets and kings it does not occur in any signs of the times article it does not occur in any review and herald article it does not occur in a general conference daily bulletin okay so at this point when when i was reading prophets and kings 556.4 it is stated that Daniel's prayer had been offered in the first year of Darius, verse 1, meaning 11-1. Yeah. The Median monarch whose general Cyrus had wrested from Babylonia the scepter of universal rule. The reign of Darius was honored of God. To him was sent the angel Gabriel to confirm and strengthen him. Right. So she's referring back to Daniel chapter 9. Well, okay, but she's also giving the reference here directly in Daniel 11, 1. Right. So that the I stood to confirm and strengthen would be Gabriel. Right, which is the position I have. Correct. And I'm, I'm in agreement with you. Yeah, but I'm also saying that she's when she's talking about the prayer of Daniel... She's talking right. about the prayer of Daniel in Daniel chapter 9, because it's going to be in the in Daniel chapter 9, in the first year of Darius the Mede, that this is referring back to, right? Because that's Very much agreed. Be, yeah, okay. Now, that gives us a link to take these portions of Daniel 9, 10, 11, and I believe it's been established 12. Yeah. That this is all basically referencing for a common vision. Right. It's all the same vision. It, okay. well, 10, well, 10, 11, and 12 are the same vision. Right. But, 
nine is what gives us the the foundation. Right. So yeah, you need to have, well, I'd even say chapter eight, but like all these last parts, they're all in a continuation. God is continuing to unfold to Daniel in different visions the this specific truth. Right. Right. So Daniel eight is then referenced in chapter nine. And in this last vision, chapter nine is being referenced in various ways. Right. So because the matter and also, of course, the fact that you're dealing with this uh, event in the first year of Darius, that this is referring back to Daniel chapter nine. So so they're all part of a continuous story. And, right. and Daniel chapter nine, the reason why Daniel then is because in Daniel chapter eight, I mean, it's quite, a, you know, it's what, 19 years previous um, to I think it's nine years. I'm trying to remember. I know it's 19 years uh, previous, I think, to the fall of Babylon. But anyway. But the point is uh, that, you know, there's this long period of time between eight and nine. And, and during that period, he's had all this time to think about chapter eight. But when he gets to the fall of Babylon, now he's going to seek God because he knows that that time is near. Right. And, and so at that time, near the end of that prophecy, he's going to be unfolded all of this light, which he didn't have. Um, you know, for 19 years. So why God chose to do that in that way, I don't know, but that's how it occurs. <laughs> right. So, Prophets and Kings 556, paragraph 4, also <laughs> gives, gives further information because upon his death, upon the death of Darius, Within about two years of the fall of Babylon, Cyrus succeeded to the throne, and the beginning of his reign, the beginning of Cyrus's reign, marked the completion of the 70 years since the first company of Hebrews had been taken by Nebuchadnezzar from their Judean home to Babylon. Right. And so that's going to be in the fall of 537. Right. Right. So that, that, and that marks the end of the 70 years. Now, we know it's still going to be six months before Cyrus issues his decree. Right. Okay. And. So it's it's interesting with, with the different symbols that you're using with Daniel 11. 1, mm -hmm. Because. We know that. The Millerites were left in a condition of perplexity on October 22nd, 1844, right? Mm -hmm. Yet the Hebrew word that is being used in 11.1 strengthen, mm -hmm. if you look at the numbers and they were reordered, you would be able to look at that strengthened as 1845. Yeah. And weren't the Millerites, didn't they begin to be strengthened by their Bible study in 1845? Yes. Yeah. Though primarily it's 1850 that they really, um, that's when they really buckled down and, um, my understanding is it's in 1850 Okay. that they put together. And that's why they produced the 1850 chart. That was when they came together where she talks about how, you know, they studied and they came to where they couldn't move any further. And then she was taken off in division. That's going to be 1850. Right. Because right? they really hadn't organized enough that they had a group of people to study until about 1850. Right. There was, um, you know, all kinds of different things happening in that that intervening period from 1844 to 1850. That, you know, they're, now they're going to, in 1850, they're going to have uh, the present truth, which becomes the Review and Herald, right? They're going to have all of the different things 
in place, but those weren't really happening in 1845. Um, anyway, so understand what you're saying. So we have some symbols here that we're going to have to look at in these Hebrew numbers and other things. Now, just talking about Samuel Snow's template here, you can see Samuel Snow's letters at the top, and what you focus on is this February 16th to June 22nd. That's 126 days. And the center date is April 19th. Um, and they all have to do with the dates of Samuel Snow's letters. The first one is when it, the first letter is written, when it's published the first time, and then April 3rd when it's published the second time. And then April 19th is just the first day of the first month, and then you have May 2nd, his second letter, and then his third letter is June 22nd. And then if you count from June 22nd, 391.5 days, you'll rely, arrive at July 18th. Now that would be July 18th. Uh, 1845, but just as a symbol, you can see the connection between June 22nd and July 18th. And then if you look just below it, you see eight, 2018. So you're going to have June 9th, 2018, and you're going to have the 120 days, which I had marked, the 126 days was Daniel from Brazil. And then we have July 27th when Daniel writes out his prediction and takes a screenshot on his phone. And then the center date of between June 9th and October 13th is August 11th. And August 11th, Julian is 13 days later. And you can see that all of those dates line up spatially with Samuel Snow's letters. And of course, we know from October 13th, 2018, we counted 391.5 days to November 9th, 2019. You can ignore some of the other stuff in this diagram. But uh, the point is here, and I probably could have just used the next page because there I get rid of all that extraneous matter. You can see it here a little cleaner. Um, so this became a basis for understanding uh, uh, July 18th, Julian. Samuel Snow's letters helped provide and establish July 18th, Julian. Um, that it was connected to uh, our history. So July 18th um, from Samuel Snow's letters is connected to, to July 18th. And so we used this initially when we were just dealing with July 18th, Julian. And then we used Josiah Litch's prophecy to provide us with July 18th, Gregorian in 2020. Um, now, the Levitical chiasm itself um was this structure and let me see if i can find it here quickly i guess i might have done it like 63 weeks mm. yeah so this is um part of the levitical chiasm this is that latter part where we got that January 11th date. This is where we take these dates and we get the 327, March 27th, or we do it the other way and we get January 11th to, uh, as a date in the 63 weeks between them. Um, right, and here's the whole Levitical chiasm. So this is 126 days where we get the time setting, the 329 days going to September 7th with March 27th as the center, and then the 126 days that we just showed you there. So, so this, this ties us to this uh, January 11th date, which of course ties us to the 777 structure um, that's going to be connected to this. And, but it also gives us a symbol of Collins study, right? So with Collins, we're gonna have, <clears throat> somewhere in here, yeah, so this is uh, called parts of Collins study. This is 
that part that where he has the 19 days and the 46 days. So from uh, uh, Biden's election where he wins, leading up to the siege of Washington, D.C., the 65 days. So he, he recognizes that this is connected to, um, and then November 22nd here, um, I think, I'm not sure why, what was the date on November 22nd? What did that 19 days, was that when uh, he was declared as president or what happened on that date, November 22nd, 2020, that Colin had marked there? Anybody remember? Trying to recall. Yeah, because any, anyway, it was marked. Uh, November 22nd was marked. Um, as these 19 days, that's what Colin had done. And let me just do a check here. It's the 327th day of the year, Iran says. Um, it's also interesting that it was two years, eight months, and 28 days ago. Okay, two years, eight months, 28 days. So it's basically 28, 28. Okay, yeah, that's interesting. Okay, anyway, Colin had marked that date, and I can't remember what he marked about that date, but he had it connected to uh, the election of Joe Biden, and then he has the 65 days or 66, 46 days ending with the siege of Washington plus the 65 days ending there. And so if we took this structure and we worked it out, we would have to have at the end of the November midterm election, another period of 65 days. And that brings us to January 11th, 2023. So that's where Collins study brings us to. And, and so that, that understanding of January 11th, it has these two different applications in our history. And we then have to say, well, why is that symbol there? So okay, November the 7th. Was, November, yeah. Was when Biden was declared the winner. Right. And I was at Collins that day and I was driving back because that's going to be a Sabbath, right? I think you're probably right. Yeah, yeah, because I was driving back and they were celebrating in the streets and stuff, according to the news. <clears throat> so, so anyway, so that was November 7th. But there's something about November 22nd, which I can't find what, what, what Colin had placed there, what event. But that was, you know, that was what he had done. So, so when we look at this verse then, we, we know that this verse is a symbol. We, we've seen it in other places. Um, so we're not going to just... Uh, you know, dismiss it. And we've connected it in Judges. We've connected it with Collins' date, so January 11th, 2023. Um, so, so the fact that it's 111 weeks is 777 days, and the fact that Jeff has this, we, we have to take it in consideration, but I'm not sure what that means as far as placing it on the line. It could just be an understanding of Daniel 11 that's unfolding to this movement that's symbolized by this January 11th date. Now, um, in preparing for the study, what I'd done is read uh, quite a bit and tried to find 
sort of a, a simple way to present this history. So we know that Darius the Mede is the king of the Medes, and that in spite of the fact that Herodotus does not mention him in his histories, the evidence is that he is Cyaxares the second. So, and that's from Xenophon's history of Persia, the media in Persia. Xenophon is a little bit later than Herodotus, but Herodotus said he had four different conflicting stories about that history, and he chose one of them to record in his um, stories, right, of, of that history. And the facts sort of bear out that Herodotus's account is wrong. That is, Herodotus has Astyges um, as the last king of the Medes, and that he's basically conquered by Cyrus, who's a Persian king. But that's not really supported by any contemporary documents, actually, that contradict that story. So Herodotus's um, uh, account, his histories, really, even though they may be reliable here and there in some other places, and they're definitely not very reliable, uh, Xenophon's account agrees with the scriptures. Now, we, of course, accept the scriptures, but um, they agree with it. So, um, so a person can look at this Wikipedia article on Cyaxares II, um, and now in ancient Greek, yeah, this, you know, what his name actually was in, um, in Persian is quite a bit different, but we'll just kind of take it as, so in Xenophon's Cryopedia, he, he says that Cyaxares II became king after Astyges to the throne of the Media Empire, and that he was also the brother of Mundane, Cyrus's great mother. So that's why Cyrus, that um, Cyrus is the great mother. So if you think that through, you can see that he's the uncle, right? So that is, that's his mom's brother. And he's the king of Persia. He describes the Persian Cyrus II, the Great, as leading the campaign to conquer Babylon in 539 BC, while his uncle, Cyaxares II, remained in Ecbatana. Cyaxares II was by then an old man, and because Cyrus II, the Great, was in command of the campaign, the army came to regard Cyrus the Great as king. After Cyrus II, the Great, invited Cyaxares to a palace he had prepared for him in Babylon, Cyaxares granted him his daughter, Cyrus is the second, the great's first cousin, in marriage with the Median kingdom as his dowry. On the assumption that Cyaxares II is Darius the Mede, it is claimed that he nominally reigned from Babylon as head of the Media Persian Empire for two years until his death, the real power being Cyrus II, the great's. Upon the death of Cyaxares II, the empire passed peaceably to Cyrus the second, Cyrus the Great, right? So in this article, they're going to go through about the debate, uh, and they're going to give the evidences for this story, Xenophon's account, and then they're going to present the conflicting evidence, and you can see it's pretty weak. Um, so the conflicting evidence is not really very conflicting. It's, it's more an interpretive uh, type of evidence rather than factual evidence. You know, for instance, they mention here that there isn't any uh, documents mentioning Darius the Mede. However, it's pointed out that, that probably um, it says any reference to Darius the Mede would have to be very explicit and otherwise unexplainable to be recognized as such by conventional scholars. That is, anytime they saw Darius, they just assume it's Darius the Persian, right? So they don't have, um, so it could be, there could be all kinds of documents referring to Darius the Mede. It just doesn't call him Darius the Mede. And so they just see the name Darius, oh, that must be Darius the Persian. So those are the types of conflicting evidence. 
So it's pretty clear because we accept the scriptures that this is the case. Darius the Mede is Cyaxares. Um, and then Ellen White's account uh, agrees with that. Even though she doesn't mention him by name, it agrees with that whole history of the two years, that he's the uncle. Well, if he's the uncle, then obviously that has to be Cyaxares. So, <clears throat> yeah, so we know on November 22nd uh, that um, uh, we have the death of JFK as well as uh, um, C.S. Lewis and um, uh, the other guy, um, Aldous Huxley. They all died on that same date. No, nobody remembers C.S. Lewis's dying. There were Aldous Huxley dying, but we all remember, if we were alive then, uh, JFK's death. Um, so that November 2nd, 22nd date, I guess, is interesting, as Angela's pointing out, in that um, they're both Catholic presidents. Now, how Catholic, you know, is a Catholic president? Um, definitely weren't not really what I call Catholics, but but anyway, they are connected to the Catholic Church. Um, yeah, so there's theories that why he was murdered. I don't buy into the conspiracy theories. I know some of you do, but uh, they're not provable things. So if they're not provable things, uh, then I tend not to accept them because that goes against Miller's rules. But anyway. <clears throat> Uh, but we can see there the connection between JFK, November 22nd, and this November 22nd date that Colin has put in the lawn. Anyway, so that, that, but we should be well established that Cyrus the Mede, or Cyrus the Great, is the nephew of Darius the Mede, and that the story in Xenophon agrees with what we uh, see in the scriptures. Now, one of the other conflicting things is these things called the Cyrus Cylinder and the Nabonidus Chronicle. Now, the Nabonidus Chronicle, I don't see as a conflict with the story of, that, of this history. It, it, to me, it's, it's actually a confirmation of it. The thing that the Nabonidus Chronicle does is it focuses upon Cyrus. So the whole idea of these, this history, it's, we, we would call them contemporary documents. That is, it would be like a newspaper account, but it would be like a newspaper account when you have, uh, you know, MSNBC writing about Biden, right? So you know Biden exists. Um, you know, you can read it in MSNBC. It's it's it, it's contemporary, but it, it's propaganda, and so it's quite clear that the Nabonidus Chronicle and the Cyrus Cylinder are both propaganda pieces. But they confirm the details of the Bible in uh, what has happened, right? They may not mention some people, like for instance, Belshazzar is not mentioned by name in the Nabonidus Chronicle, but they focus on, upon uh, Nabonidus, who's the king of Babylon. And he's technically the king because Cyrus, or, or Belshazzar, we know, is. Uh, you know, the second in command. But there's nothing there that contradicts the Bible. Just because something isn't mentioned doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Right? So just because he's not named would not be a reason to, to say that it doesn't agree. So they're focusing upon, and what Cy the, the Nabonidus Chronicle is doing, it's showing that Cyrus is this hero because Nabonidus really didn't respect uh, the proper gods of Babylon, um, and, and, and Cyrus had come to deliver them from this sort of false worship. And, and so, you know, because Nabonidus didn't really truly respect um, uh, the spring and fall feasts, right, because he was, he was a follower of Marduk, um, so he was a monk, a Mardukian monk, and so uh, which went against a lot of the beliefs of the common people. So, so, but we can see if you look at the documents and you look at them objectively, 
it agrees with the scripture. Now, how that relates to our understanding of history, our, um, as we apply it to our time, we can see that there are parallels. So there's parallels in the sense of um, propaganda, um, how we then are going to interpret this history of what has happened. Because there are different interpretations, even of just the reality of what's occurring in the United States at the present time. Right? So you have you know, people who are followers of Trump. The election was stolen from Trump. You know, Trump is this victim. But somehow he's a victim that's not a bad kind of victim to be because he's a victim from the establishment. Right? So the, he's, he's the little guy who's being trampled by this you know, machinery of so because you know Trump doesn't want to be a victim in the sense of, of regular types of victims. He's a particular type of victim. Right? People understand what I'm talking about here. Hopefully. So so we can see that there's these interpretations of what happened. There are people who love Biden and don't even think that Biden Biden has dementia, right? Right. So they're living in a delusional world where they can see somebody with dementia and, and believe that he's actually running the country. Um, so we know he can't possibly be because he can't you know, ride a bike. So or walk, or walk upstairs or walk. And you can just see him. You know that he has the signs of a dementia just physically. So even if you never heard him talk, you could watch him and see that he has dementia. So. <clears throat> But anyway, we have this, this um, if, if we're going to talk about this history and the controversy, in a sense, that controversy parallels the controversy that we have today, both within the world and within the movement. How do we interpret the reality of what's happening? So we can see even this controversy about Darius the Mead, who is he, parallels what we are going through in our understanding of truth. Does that make sense to people? So we go by what's recorded in the scripture of truth. The scripture of truth says that Darius the Mede existed. So we may then need to understand what that means. Now, as far as a Hebrew number that I find interesting, is this number here for Darius the Mede? 1867. What, what is 1867 as a symbol? Well, you've got two years after the Civil War. Okay. Well, what if you took it as 186 da or slash 7? Okay. <clears throat> July 18th. Well, and so from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month is 186 days cardinal and 187 days ordinal. Right. right. So it's 186 slash 7. That's... So when I see 186 or I see 187, I still think of it as the same symbol. When I see 186, 7, again, it's the same symbol to me. It's something that's marking the 10th day of the seventh month. But it, it's also relating to July 18th, because July 18th is related to that symbol, right, to the 187. And... Um, so when we have here the first year of Darius the Mede, now we know the symbol of July 18th. We, we've taken it as a symbol, July 18th, 2020. But we know that the primary symbol there is this symbol of the Day of Atonement. Right? So I first noticed 187 and 186 in connection with the period from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. And I noticed it when in 2013, when Jeff proposed um, 
this idea of uh, Ezra 7, 9, uh, where we talk about the first day of the fifth month and we have to sort of place it in Millerite history. So on that date, when he asked the question, whatever it was, August 30th or 31st, I can't remember, it was on the Sabbath. And I did the calculation and found the first day of the fifth month being August 15th. Then, you know, I, I knew that because I could count the number of days from the first day of the first month to the first day of uh, the tenth day of the seventh month. And then we're going to have Noel present that in the summer uh, of the next year. So it took a while for that to become general knowledge in the movement, even though I had figured it out. Um, and then it was accepted, right? But nobody knew that I had figured it out. I don't even think I told Jeff. I just figured it out. Um, so, so we have this symbol, 186, 187. Now, why is it important? What, what is the significance of taking this symbol that comes from the understanding of the Day of Atonement and the placing of the Midnight Cry correctly in Millerite history? Why is that important for what we then predicted on July 18, 2020? Why is that symbol tied together to our history? You mean beside it being a, a further validation of of what we've been studying with this, with 187? Yeah, well, I'm saying just the primary application. Like, why did God use that symbol in our time? He took the symbol that marked October 22, 1844, and we made a prediction for July 18, 2020, based upon that symbol. So we should be able to see then that our history is paralleling Millerite history. The same symbol is being used for our disappointment as the Millerite disappointment. Right? Okay. Okay. So you can see that this is something that parallels our history. Now, when it comes to Darius, um, on what date did Darius become king on the, on, the, on the Babylonian calendar? Not this Darius, but Darius the Persian. So I'm just, so I'm talking about a different Darius. I don't recall the date. It's the 10th day of the seventh month. Okay. On what day did Xerxes uh, call um, Vashti out to come and show her beauty to the people at the party? Would it also have been the 10th day of the seventh month? 10th day of the seventh month, right? So we have this symbol, the 10th day of the seventh month, continually showing up in the history of the decrees, in the history of these kings. So this symbol is an important symbol. Now, we know, of course, the 2300 days is going to begin on the 10th day of the seventh month. And, right, and even remember, 220 days as a symbol can be seven months and 10 days, right? Even though, you know, the number of days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month is not 220. But you can take 220 as prophetic months and... 210 days is seven prophetic months, and then you have 10 days left over. That would be, so it's a symbol of July 18th, or not July, October 22nd, the, the 187 days. So all through this history, the prophecies in, in Daniel are giving us this symbol because it's going to be related to these kings, to these decrees, these symbols of 187, or the 10th day of the seventh month, the 107. Um, you know, for instance, when I was doing the study last night uh, with the gypsies here, 
you know, I did this study dealing with, let me show it to you, and how I can do such a complicated study and they understand it I, in, in when I'm doing such short uh, presentations is quite a miracle. But you can see that we have these two chiasms in 457 BC. So I took two studies to explain this. The first one I did in one study, this one I did in another. But you can see that this 107 days here represents the 10th day of the seventh month, which is going to be the center of this chiasm. Right. And of course, this 107 days produces Pentecost, which is going to be when Christ begins his ministry in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And then the 10th day of the seventh month is going to mark when in 1844, at the end of the 2300 days, when Christ begins his ministry in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. Right. So 50 days after Christ's resurrection, the 50th day. The Holy Spirit's going to be poured out at Pentecost, right? And that's, and Ellen White says that's the inauguration of Christ's work in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So, so we can see that, you know, this 10th day of the seventh month symbol or the 187 symbol, all of these um, have a part to play in, in both in this history and in Millerite history, and in our history. So if we're going to look at an understanding of Daniel chapter 11, these things always have to be kept in mind, that, that we're dealing with symbols, and we're making application of those symbols. But those symbols exist in the past, right? They come from the past. We didn't just... We didn't just create them with July 18th. These, these were symbols that are all through scripture. So we have Darius. This goes back to a history. So another important thing about this is we know that we're going back to a history that is the beginning of the time of the end for our time, right? But it's also the time of the end for the Persian kingdom. Now we know there are some characteristics about Persia. It's a two-horn power, right? The Medes are the big horn, right? And then, how does it go? Let me see, I've got to get this right. So this is Daniel chapter 8. Um, and so it says, um, the ram which had two horns, the two horns were high, but the higher one than the other, and the higher came up last, right? So that's going to be Persia. So I got it backwards. So Media is going to be the, um, the first horn, but it's not going to be the higher horn. It's going to be a lower horn, and it's going to come up last. Persia is. It's going to come up last. So media Persia goes first. It's the lower horn. Then the higher horn comes up last, that Persia, right, which is, that's the history that, that uh, Xenophon gives. Okay? So, so we have this Media Persia, and, but it's a two-horn power. It's Republican and in Protestantism, right? It's the United States. So one of the things that Colin shows is that when we deal with Nebuchadnezzar's golden image, um, that this is this is Nebuchadnezzar is representing here the Sunday Law, and he's going to take that that statue that's given in chapter two, and he's going to say. Well, I'm not just a head of gold. I'm the entire kingdom. My kingdom's unending. Right? He's going to force people to bow down and worship it. It's a type of the Sunday law. And um, when we get to Daniel chapter 11, one of the things that Colin uh, tries to argue is that this is United States all the way through. Because we're connecting this with the Sunday law, then that we have to then say, well, this is... The United States, right? So it's the United States is Persia, but then this king, the mighty king that stands up, must also be the United States. Now we, of course, have uh, Xerxes being Trump, right? So we're going to look at this, but I'm just just kind of giving some background information. 
The point that I'm trying to make here is that we're making an application. That is, this is not the primary interpretation of this prophecy. If we want to understand this prophecy, we need to understand how it was historically fulfilled. And then we need to understand the symbols that we can apply it to our history. But we can't just interpret a prophecy, and I'm not saying that Colin is doing this, but people do this. They will, they will take the prophecy that's been fulfilled in the past, and they will just reinterpret it without considering its historical application. And, and we know we can't do that, right? So whatever interpretation we come up with, it has to agree with the history that is being repeated, right? Would we agree with that? Yes. Yeah, because these prophecies are not being repeated. Back when uh, uh, um, Charles, what was his name? Charles Wheeling, um, back in the 80s, was taking Ellen White's statements regarding Daniel chapter 11, where she says the history in connection with this prophecy will be repeated. Uh, he took that as we can just repeat these prophecies in their literal sense and take their time elements and make them literal. And of course, Ellen White doesn't say these histories are go these prophecies are going to be repeated. She says the history in connection with the prophecy will be repeated, which means we have to understand the history. And history is repeated. So it's always the case. And, and we see this from all these stories that we've looked at. The history keeps being repeated. So, um, so now we have Darius. So I think that's what we've been able to establish so far. That this Darius the Mede is, and, and that, it, that is, we can't read Daniel chapter 11 as if this vision is happening in the first year of Darius the Mede. It's referring us back to Daniel chapter 9's vision. And, and Darius the Mede was strengthened in conquering Babylon. Right? So in the decisions that he was making, Cyrus is the general, but he's still connected to that history. And so I stood, that is Gabriel, I stood to confirm and strengthen him. <clears throat> and then it says, and now I will show thee the truth. So this has to go back to chapter 10, verse 21, right? I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things, but Michael, your prince. So that is me and Christ are the ones that understand this. Right? At least that's how I take that verse. Now, this idea of holdeth with me, um, uh, you know, has lots of different meanings. Um, but it, it can mean to with, withstand. Right. Um, so the, him and him and Christ, according to Gabriel, are are standing on this, these points. They're involved in it. Um, and then, of course, we know that Michael, your prince, is Christ. So when it says um, in verse two, and now I will show thee the truth. This is actually what's in the scripture of truth. So it's not like, well, I'm going to tell you the truth now because, you know, it's like in the sense of not lie to you. No, he's saying that I'm unfolding to you some truth. Now, this word, of course, is the Hebrew word emeth, which means truth. And, and that word has, even in a, of itself, uh, sureness, reliability, stability, continuance, uh, faithfulness, reliableness. But it refers to something that, that's solid. It's a solid foundation of truth. And so what Gabriel's presenting is the foundation of Adventism. It's the truth. It's something that, that we can trust in. It's reliable. It's firm, right? So this is not some uh, guesswork. And, and if it's not guesswork, that means we can't be guessing at it. It needs to be something that's so solid and established that we can depend upon it. So then we know that there's there shall stand up yet three kings in Persia. 
this word yet is the word od, means properly iteration or continuance. Now this is something that occurs in Leviticus 26 uh, with the third seven times. Right, so uh, not going to go into that whole study, but um, I'll put yet seven times for your sins. So this is the same word. Um, and so there's going to yet be three kings in Persia, and the fourth shall be far richer than they all. And by his strength, through his rich his riches, he shall stir up all against the realm of Grecia. So this is pretty straightforward. We know that it's going to be that Cyrus is the king at this time, right? That's what we find in chapter 10. And that we know historically Cambyses, False Myrtus, and Darius the Great are going to be the three. And then the fourth is going to be Xerxes. Now, we know that that's noted in the scripture of truth in that it's in the book of Ezra. Now, when Daniel is written, does the book of Ezra exist? It's a pretty simple question to answer. No. No, it didn't, right? So, so how can we then say that Daniel is going to be told, I, I, now I will show thee the truth, right? And that truth is going to be what's noted in the scripture of truth. How can, how can Angel Gabriel say that? when the book of Ezra has not yet been written and where we're going to have an account of these kings, that is, these kings haven't actually happened yet, right? This is in the time of Cyrus. So we haven't had Cabasis, False Myrtus, and Darius the Great yet, or Xerxes. So how do we, how do we take that statement? I'll show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. Now that word just means to be recorded in the scripture of truth. So is there some other place where this is recorded? Or is this just simply uh, referring to a prophecy? So we know obviously Daniel can't have been written after Ezra. It wasn't written in the second century BC. It was written when it, you know, by Daniel. So he's recounting this vision. So how do we account for this? How can he refer to what's noted in the scripture of truth when the scripture of truth hasn't yet noted that? I would have to say no. Okay, so what do you mean no? Can he be noted as being in the scripture of truth when the scripture of truth has not noted it? Yeah, so, so the scripture of truth must have noted it in some way. Okay. <laughs> Even though we have, the only place we could explicitly say it's noted is in Ezra. Because, you know, and because that's where we have the account of these kings, right? Okay. So when it says, now I will show thee the truth. Behold, there shall yet, uh, there still stand up yet three kings in Persia. He can't be referring to a book that has not existed as being noted in the scripture of truth. So that's what you're saying. Right. But, but there has to be some way in which we understand this. So how would we understand it? So Angela says God's foreknowledge is in Isaiah 46, verse 9 to 11. Okay. Now, so when we go to Isaiah um, 46, right, this is going to be talking about, um, I mean, this is, you could have all kinds of places where you find this type of idea. But declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Say, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. 
calling a ravenous bird from the east and the man that executes my counsel from a far country. Yea, I have spoken it, I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will also do it. Now, we can see this clearly in, in Isaiah 46, but remember, you're going to have in Isaiah 45 and the end of 44, Cyrus being mentioned by name. And Cyrus, it's more than 100 years before Cyrus is born, or about 100 years before Cyrus is born, that Isaiah writes this down. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings, that's Belshazzar, his knees smoting one against the other, to open before him the two leaved gates in Babylon, and the gates shall not be shut. Right? I'll give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches and secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. And that's that's what's going to be happening in Daniel chapter 10. Cyrus is going to know about these. So, so is there somewhere we can say that these kings of Persia are noted in the scripture of truth that's not in the book of Daniel? Be in Ezra and Nehemiah one, would it? Yeah, but in Ezra and Nehemiah, again, that's written after the book of Daniel about... 80 years later or more. So, so we're not going to have an account of those kings, a record of them, until after that history has passed. And that's going to be in, in the book of Ezra. Yeah. So how do we account for that? Where do we find these three kings prophetically? In God's word, how do we before they happen? Okay, do we have something that is typical of that history? that we can use. Okay, just think about in in Daniel chapter 11, so you guys are going to have some times to think about it a day. Um, so why is it that there's three kings and then a fourth? What's the principle here that's in scripture? Okay, it's a three-one combination. Do we have lots of three-one combinations throughout scripture? We get one at um the um, golden image with um, the three Hebrews. Yeah, okay. So so we could, we could take earlier parts of Daniel and we could say, well, these things are typical, right? This 3-1 this combination. Where did you get the types of what the <clears throat> types of the history, right? So when we say what's noted in the scripture of truth, it's not just what's noted about these three kings, because that's going to be later, but it's what's noted throughout scripture that all of these things that happened before times are illustrations of what's going to happen in this history, the 3-1 the combination. So that this pattern has already existed in order for, so what's being unfolded to Daniel here is not something that's unique, it's something that's common. And notice that, that this is going to happen in Persia, right? You're going to have the three kings and then the fourth. 
And then you're going to have Greece, a mighty king. And, and you're going to have his history, the history of Greece, unfold and illustrate the same history. That is, in each of these stories, each of these lines, it's a repetition of the same pattern of understanding. Right? That's how, that's how we've approached the scriptures in this movement. We're not interpreting these scriptures like the Protestants do, where we, we speculate, where we take some, something and some characteristic and we apply it in a literal way, and then in another time we apply it in a, in a non-literal way, without anything to guide us other than our, our guessing. Right? So we can't guess. That's one of Miller's rules. Well, you do have a um, Ahab, Jezebel, and a false prophet. Right. So and we have Elijah. Right. So we have all through the Bible, this yeah. same story is being told. It's noted in the Scripture of Truth. And and so what what's going to happen now is the angel Gabriel is going to fold unfold to Daniel. This application of this principle in what's going to happen with Persia, right? So, because what we have is a line. This line is not unique, right? We're going to have, you know, Darius the Mede and Cyrus, and then you're going to have three, and then one. Millerite history has the same idea. You have the time of the end, and then you're going to have three angels' messages. And then one. And so you can see that you would have to take these three kings and you would have to look at them as three messages. And then the fourth would be the repetition of those messages. You can see that with Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece. You have these characteristics of these nations. And then you have this fourth beast. It's a 3 1 combination because the fourth beast, Rome, is uh, syncretistic. Um, power that is Rome adopts characteristics of Babylon, characteristics of Medo Persia, and characteristics of Greece. Right? It assimilates the, the characteristics of the nations that it conquers, becomes part of its characteristics. The papacy does the same thing. That's one of its characteristics that marks it as Rome. It's syncretism. So, so anyway, you're going to think about this um, as we go into this uh, tomorrow. Any any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we are grateful to once again um, have your Holy Spirit speaking to us. And for the studies this week, Lord, we, we have much we have to learn. And uh, I just pray that you can enlighten our minds and that you can um, reveal your truths to us. Um, be with us throughout this day. Bring us together again according to thy will. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.